right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego on the West Coast of the USA. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Anjali Sharma, who is in Singapore, one of my favorite places. How are you doing, Anjali? Very well, thank you. Fantastic. And Anjali is the Managing Director of Narrative, uh, the business of stories, and works with private and government organizations to determine what their individual and unique business challenges are. And by incorporating story skills, she crafts individualized solutions to help them so solve those problems. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is um, organizational change and storytelling. So I guess, uh, Anjali, to start off is, I mean, when people hear storytelling, they often think of it in a sales context only, you know, you tell stories to, it's a good thing to incorporate into your, into your sales uh, approach. But storytelling in the, ter in, in the context of organizational change and staff engagement and all of that, um, tell me a little bit about that. That's a different, that's something a little different. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when storytelling has had its own evolution, it started off with the whole thing as leadership language. Um, and then, you know, obviously storytelling for sales and marketing and branding and all of that came. Uh, but storytelling for change, organizational change ha is a huge, huge uh, thing. Um, but I think the thing to remember is, you know, as, as Daniel Pink said, to sell is human. If you're not selling mm -hmm. externally, you're selling internally. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the job of the leader is to see the, the need for the change before anyone else sees it and, and compel people to want to jump on that change journey. So the changes that, you know, to give you examples of some of the changes that we are helping organizations implement right now with storytelling is an organization has, uh, um, is investing $27 million in artificial intelligence. Now, mm. if you and I worked in an organization and my boss came and said to me, everybody in this organization has to have an artificial intelligence led project. It uh, doesn't matter. You don't have to be an engineer or technical person. Human resources, marketing, um, you know, team assistance, everybody has to have it. So we are going to be very freaked out because we don't know anything about this. So how does this leader then tell you a story that not only, uh, you know, puts this fire in your belly to want to learn about artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, but also learns with the reason that I want to be the workforce of the future. Um, you know, it's uh, not just about organizational productivity and efficiency. It's also about the individual wanting to change and see their own future. And that's really the job of the leader to show the end to show people that you have a future in this change, not just the organization. Yeah, and I think I think that's a that's a great uh, example, actually, artificial intelligence or automation or something like that. Because let's face it. When we first hear about it, if you're in an organization and you hear, oh, there's a big artificial intelligence initiative coming, you know, most individuals, their first reaction is going to be, ooh, what does that mean for me? Does that mean I'm going to be replaced? Is this some kind of, uh, is this the start of, of a process where we're humans are replaced? Yeah, because naturally we always go to the worst case scenario because that's how great humans are. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess in the, in the example you're using, this is where it's really incumbent on the leadership to tell the story of why this is important and why maybe it, it, the implications aren't what you think they are. Yeah, so I think how you just said it, it we just need to get into the habit of pulling it slightly longer and pushing the horizon slightly further. What I mean by that is, uh, the natural tendency of anybody, uh, the logical brain thinks, let me just tell them why it is important mm -hmm. and why the implications are not as, as you know, as you think they are. Uh, that's that we need to push forward means, why is it important for you? Um, so the story that the leader has to tell is about you. It's not about the organization. Um, and what we notice is that in any of these changes, if we can show an individual and employee's future with this change. So, you know, Sheryl Sandberg very famously once said in an interview that one of the best advice she's ever gotten from 
when from from her boss the google when she told that i'm going to go work for facebook everybody said what you're going to work with those 20 year olds uh, her boss at google said to her that go for growth uh, go for an organization which is growing because you will find growth in it i think that is what the leaders have to be able to do to show the individuals growth with the organizations growth through the change uh, digital transformations that the organizations are doing most leaders don't push the horizon that far they just stop at an organizational growth yeah and 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 something else that you touched on there is a, a lot of leaders you know tend to as you say just lay out the facts of the case like here's what we're going to do and here's why and the reality is as you know um people receive information in different ways and and obviously you know, there's an emotion attached to it and all of that stuff. So that's where that's where storytelling in some ways can cut across many different communication styles. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, see, storytelling is also a tool that actually really, if used well, takes into account that the story is a for you. Um, mm -hmm. The story caters to you. Um, and if we start putting the story together like that, then the change it becomes a successful change implementation within organization. A lot of the times organizations are not able to do that because they sit in the boardroom, the leadership team or the team that is designed, that is um, sort of uh, made responsible for making the change happen, sit in the boardroom, and just based on the surface level understanding, start building the story that they need to tell. I'm yet to come across a project that I have worked on where I have been able to figure out the story I wanna tell by just having conversations at the boardroom level. I've had to go down at the coal face and figure out what's the story they really wanna hear um, and then be able to craft the story. So what's the point I'm making? The point I'm making is that you can't possibly story tell unless you're willing to story listen. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating point there. And I think also, I think if you go, a lot of people in leadership positions today, if you just said to them, oh, you need to get better at storytelling, they would, they may confuse that with narrative or whatever, and just say that it's not. So maybe explain a little bit more about, let's go back to our example about AI. If you were saying like there's AI initiatives coming, what kind of story would you help somebody craft around that? Yeah, so there are various layers to it. So, so for example, mm -hmm. this is our desired outcome, right? We want to get to this. Um, I think where a lot of people uh, start their preparation is, uh, let's just tell them what it is about, why it is important, and what are the advantages, what are the benefits, knowledge, reasons, um, advantages, kind of the space that people sit in. That's just how we are trained to think. Um, and, and we start, then we say, okay, we've got that content. Now let's work really hard on this person who is going to deliver this to make this person's delivery really good. Um, and, you know, we've also been taught about the whole delivery thing is, uh, um, I remember seeing someone's video the other day where they were saying, uh, where they had taken Malcolm Gladwell's speech and said, mm -hmm. really marked how, how high his hand goes, how high, you know, how he turns his head at certain point. Um, and I, I feel a little bit sad looking at that because I think what we are trying to tell people is to codify uh, what should naturally come to you. Um, yeah. And I think the reason to a reason to put so much theatrics into delivery comes from the fact that the belief doesn't happen within. Um, so then you have to portray and project. Um, we're in, in an organization that is having an artificial intelligence led project. My preparation starts off with what's going on with the employees who need to kind of for wh wh where where is this <clears throat> the objection for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. what is in their mind so i'll give you an example when i started working on this particular project which is the ai project i thought the story that i have to help the leader build is the story to tell them why it is right for them to embark on this journey and embrace artificial intelligence to show them that what has broken for them that needs fixing by via artificial intelligence but guess what when I started having the conversations with people on the ground, 
that's not the reason why we need to tell the artificial intelligence story. They bought into the concept that mm -hmm. I get AI is important. I don't need any more convincing. What's freaking me out is the fact, how am I going to do it? It sounds like I'm not even an engineer. The question, the story here was more about the assistance, the change assistance that the organization was going to provide to help them transition into becoming successful with this change. So it, it, my focus then kind of shifts in um, very little being able to tell a story about what is broken in their world, how it is affecting them, what's the human impact of it, and how artificial intelligence is uh, going to help with that. And then, hey, what's the plan to help you get there? And what's the first step you need to take today? Um, so that's how I would build it. Yeah, and it's, in, it's, it's really interesting what you outlined there because obviously it's very easy, as you said, if you just construct this in the boardroom, it's very easy to tell the wrong story and to tell a story that doesn't resonate at all. As you said, I mean, if everybody said, yeah, yeah we're, we're bought into the idea of AI and you tell the story about why it's important. I mean, obviously you have to say why it's important, but if that's your, if that's your sole focus, um, as you said, then you're missing out on the other part, which, which is about what really people care about. So I guess that's an interesting phenomenon where you you could adopt storytelling, but tell the wrong story completely. Absolutely. So, John, you know, I've never really been, you know, there have been times where I've kind of uh, said to the leader that I'm working with, this is simple. We know exactly why we are telling this story. And I have been wrong 100% of the time, 100% of the time. <laughs> um, so it has been a good thing to get into the discipline of saying, you know, I think it's like this, but let me never say, I'm 100% sure it's like this. Let me, let me go and figure it out first. Uh, that, that data that you collect, uh, now data, not just in quantitative terms, but in qualitative terms, what that means is through conversations. Um, what you collect really informs the story they want to listen. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, you really don't know the story they want to listen. You think you know the story they want to listen. Yeah, and it's so fascinating, uh, you know, what you said about actually going down into the, you know, going down into the trenches, if you like, and, and really getting people's, uh, people's insights into it. And I guess, I guess that is, if there's one takeaway for people from today, I guess is that's what you should take a look at your communications, um, your leadership and management communications, because I would, I would hazard that, uh, I guess that most of them are, you know, top down and that then you get into, because here's what happens, right? So if you put a top down story out, um, everybody nods their heads and says, yeah, okay, you know, we get it. Then the rumbling start underneath as people start asking each other. And before you know it, um, there's, there's, uh, there's people are unsettled. They're not sure. All of these things that you could easily have teased out in advance if you'd have taken that extra step. Absolutely. So, you know, obviously we call those, uh, we, we often say that the culture of the organization uh, never lives in a boardroom. It lives in a pantry. It lives in mm -hmm. corridors. Now, maybe it lives in chats because yeah. we are working remotely. Uh, but the culture of the organization is right beside the water cooler. It is, that is where uh, the real conversations happen. And I think if you take the time to story listen, then you can really tell a good story. I mean, I remember, you know, doing this, I'm actually still doing this project. It's been a couple of years. I've been in, working on a project in Japan. So there's this uh, semiconductor manufacturing uh, factory in Japan. Um, the factory was owned by a Japanese leadership for a long, a long time. And it, the culture was homogeneous. There was no, you know, everybody, nobody needed to complete their sentences. People knew what needed to be done. I mean, you know, you are Japanese, I'm Japanese, we're brought up here, we know exactly how things function. Then an American company goes and buy, buy, buys this particular factory, new leadership comes in. Uh, it's like, I am saying, 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 why are you not saying anything back? And this whole, you know, this thing starts and the company identifies that we need diversity, equity and inclusion in this company. Now we, when, we, when I first went there, uh, the story that was being told to, to the people in the factory was, you know, Japan has shortage of labor. labor. Uh, we have an aging workforce. Uh, we're not gonna have people to 
to skills, we'll have skills shortage. So we need to bring women into workforce. We need to have foreigners come and work here. We need to have more younger people continue to work in Japan and not leave Japan. People just shook their shoulders like, I don't care, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not something that... And then we started this whole process of going down at the coal face and having the conversations. And we collected like these more than hundred stories from people. These were not opinions. These were stories of people. So, you know, right. I would kind of go and talk to someone and say, talk to me about a time where as a woman you found hardworking because we're trying to increase gender diversity. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about a time where as a young person you found it hardworking with, uh, you know, a, um, a senior person. Talk to me about a time where working with a woman has been hard. Hundred stories you collect, you try, you know, you sort of look at the data you get from that hundred stories the answer sits right there as to why diversity, equity, and inclusion is not taking place in this factory. Um, so, you know, the, the insights you get, then we shift our story. We shifted our story that we need DEI, not because there's a skills shortage on the horizon. We need DEI because you will continue to work from 9 a.m. till whatever, till 3 a.m. next day if you don't get the diversity. And then people went, no wonder I work so many hours. Through those stories, we figured that that was the reason why people would want to um, say, I want to be the ambassador of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, skills shortage was not the story they wanted to hear. What they wanted to hear was, how will I go home at 5 p.m.? Yeah, and, and I think that's such a that's such a fascinating example you you bring up there because it really is so as you as you point out, so many organizations would have done it the the first way. Um, just said, here's here's some good reasons why we're doing this. And I'm, I've put out those good reasons so everybody should be happy about it. But those reasons didn't resonate with anybody. Um, and it does come down to what I'm going to what it, where, I'm always going to look at things through my own lens right and if nothing resonates in that in in that story that affects me personally i'm not really going to care about it absolutely you know as as seth gordon says um a story that does not resonate is not true even if it is factual uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not true for me, even if it is true, you can show me umpteen amount of data to prove to me that this is how it is. It's not true for me. You know, I don't, I don't yeah. really care. Yeah. And, and I do feel like um, then the, the work that you're doing, I do feel like this is, this is a big shift or change uh, because I mean, well, there's some companies will say, oh yeah, you know, we solicit feedback from our people all the time. There's a little different between soliciting feedback and then turning it into something that people, you know, a story that people can, can latch onto and adopt and, and be, you know, and, and be motivating. I, I feel like that's a big shift for a lot of organizations. You're absolutely right. So in all of these companies that I have been running these projects, uh, with, surveys as feedbacks were done uh, but mm. my question always has been so if your survey says that a communication is an issue how do you act upon that so if, if, if communication is an area where you scored the lowest from leadership how, how do you act upon it like what do you know about the communication that you can actually act upon it. So what people say is that they, they take do the survey, they put the graph out, um, and then they say, we rank the lowest in communication. Let's get a PowerPoint presentations training for our leadership team. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think uh, surveys or uh, feedback uh, and that data, see, that's qualitative data. That's, you know, that's just quantitative data you've just collected it from somewhere it yeah. doesn't give you the depth that you need to be able to really figure out what's happening now some people may argue that you know who's got the time to have these conversations and we, are, we, we are live in a time poor world um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry there are already uh, you know survey platforms that actually take the commentary that people have put in in free form and sense makes it and tells you what exactly is happening. So you may not have the time for a human to go and have a conversation. There are AI led initiatives who actually do that. And there are existing surveys uh, that, that already are providing that information. It's whether you're willing to get into that space or not, um, you know, yeah. 
or it's more of the fight in your own head john that to tell yourself that there's more to this like i have been in many of those situations right to tell myself quiet there is more to this you don't know it all just get into it and figure it out and if you walk out of there i knew it already then that's great uh, but be willing to invest you save so much time by actually investing time before um yeah. i think that that's an important thing to remember no no i i would agree with you and i do think i mean obviously surveys have their place and all of that but the but the real uh, the real treasure is behind what the survey means not not just the the data that you collect as you said it's going behind it and really understanding it because the classic one you just mentioned the classic one there you know we have a communications problem in the company what does that mean could mean a multitude of things it could mean different things to different people so if you just say okay I always love that when people, when companies say, oh, it's a communications problem in the company. I tell you what, let's put in a communication software. Let's put in a new, you know, uh, a new app that we can all communicate better. Why? And you're just going, all you're doing now is automating terrible communications, right? You're not actually fixing the problem. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I had this funny experience from my own, uh, you know, uh, corporate career where I, I remember there was this company that I worked for and they hired me and they said, they always use this term and they said, we need a rainmaker. So, you know, you guys are <laughs> yeah. people, you know what's a rainmaker. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, we need a rainmaker. We really need a rainmaker. So I felt very like uh, there was a lot of pressure to perform, you know, it was like, I came in today and I had to start delivering results yesterday. I was put as the head of business development. And every time I walked into the corridor, people were like, oh, she's the new Rainmaker. And I'd be like, okay, I have a name. My name is not Rainmaker, but anyway. Mm -hmm. So I remember my first sort of meeting with the CEO of the company, we were looking at the results and I just sat there and he showed me the numbers. And I was like, what is going on here? We worked so hard to get these numbers uh, in but overall, the, the, the graph is not going up. Why is that? And he says, like, actually, the fact is a fact. The numbers don't lie. You can see right there. And it was just really hard for me to kind of come to terms with the fact that we're working so hard and there are things happening. But when we are putting mm -hmm. them in, in the data, why is it not showing results? Our focus was on this rainmaker strategy. But when we really start spent a fun full week in dissecting that data, you know what we found? We found ourselves to be a leaky bucket. What that meant was we kept acquiring new client and we had no strategy for client retention. Uh -huh. And the client retention pie was just going out and out and out and out. So that is exactly, the numbers told us a story, but not to the depth that we were looking for it. So, you know, you look at the data, put in a communication software, you jump to the solution so quickly, you think you need another rainmaker. But you, <laughs> what you really need is a good client retention strategy. You don't need rainmaker after rainmaker. And yeah, well, that, if if you're if you can't retain your your customers, you need a you need a flood maker because um, <laughs> eventually, eventually you're never going to be able to generate enough uh, enough new clients to offset losing you know lots of clients. So yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting point there is that uh is that all the focus was in one area when the real the real issue was somewhere completely different yeah and i think it was sort of happening in such small sort of you know mm. bites that, that we almost didn't notice it so it's not like the account went missing it's the account size kept reducing yeah. over the period of time, little by little, little by little. So it was displacement. But the point there is exactly the, the, the survey point, right? You look at something and you already have a story in your head that that's what's happening. Uh, we don't yeah. uh, we, our in makers are not doing enough. Uh, it's a story you're already telling yourself. So it's a confirmation for you when you look at the number yeah. and you're willing to dissect it enough. That is exactly what happens in organizational changes as well. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting because um, in in the US, the the number one when you we always ask used to always ask this question at presentations like what's the what's the number one cause of destruction of family homes? Is it is it floods? Is it fire? You know, how, earthquakes and you know people would offer up examples. The reality it's termites, and termites. Yeah, it's true. And but the thing is, termites termites destroy a house over a long long period of time. 
and uh, and that's the same as what you were just talking about there uh, you know with the with the uh, the shrinking of the clients that's like the termites right you don't notice it you don't know it's there until one day the whole thing falls down Oh my God, John, you know, you're bringing such wonderful parallels to the work that I've been doing in the change setup as well. So I'll go back to you talk about termites. I'll tell you exactly a similar conversation we had when we were implementing change in the same factory that I'm talking about in Japan in, in Hiroshima. Um, I remember going and getting these stories and then sense making them and coming up with a point of view as to what did I think was going on in the organization for which we needed the right story to be created. And I remember the leader of the company getting up and saying to me, oh my God, I thought I had a shiny surface. Now you've taken everything off and I can see so many cockroaches underneath. Uh, <laughs> exactly the same, you know? Uh, uh, you don't know what's hidden there. And 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 slow things that, you know, as, as Hans Rosling, the author of A Factfulness says, things that happen over a period of time don't make breaking news. Um, yeah. So you never notice them. They just slow, slow progression, slow deterioration doesn't make news. Um, yeah, no, it's so true. It's so true. And, and we always love to look for the, the big singular mega cause for whatever problems were, were, you know, the one thing, if we fix this one thing, then everything else is fixed, but it's rarely like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's the one big thing, but no, not really, you know, it's the many yeah. small things. Yeah. This, uh, uh, you know, over the last three years, uh, there's this one book, um, which is called, um, uh, it's a habits book. It's been very famous um, by James Clear. Um, and, uh, you know, he talks about this concept of aggregation of marginal gains. Um, mm. And he gave this example of this uh, British cycling team when they kind of, you know, kept losing for a long time. And then they had this one person who took over. And what this person really did was very, very, very small, lots of very small things that he changed. Like, for example, the kind of gel that the cyclists were using out to relax their muscle, uh, you know, the seat that they had. Things that normally people would say, nah, that's not going to make much of a difference. Nah, uh -huh. that's not going to make much of a difference. And that's just, that just completely changed the performance of the cycling team. Um, and it's a wonderful story by James Clear um, about the performance of the cycling team. But I think the point therein is the aggregation of marginal gains, yeah. and how that leads to great places. Yeah, no, no, absolutely does. And I think that, as you said, uh, you know, things that happen over time don't tend to make breaking news and that's why we tend to live with them until they're uh, until they become catastrophic and then we jump into crisis mode which let's face it most people we love crisis mode because it's <laughs> because you can get all excited and you can all up and you can fix it and you think everything is great it's much it's much harder and less exciting to fix the small things as you go um, I completely agree and that is exactly the thing with storytelling as well you know you have to be willing to get under the surface, look at the termites, find the cockroaches, <laughs> um, and then go, you know, uh, 10 found here, three found here, yeah. two found there, maybe half is lying over there. Yeah. Um, and go, I think I have a good sense of what story I need to tell based on those little things I've found and then form the right narrative to tell. And organizational change is a tough one. And it mm -hmm. is one because it is the only thing that keeps happening in an organization all the time so i love it every time i call you know speak to my clients i haven't spoken to them for a week and i'll say oh how is everything oh we have a new change in the organization yeah. oh God, you know that's the only constant you know yeah. uh, we either have a restructuring or we have a new crm system being deployed or we have a new ways of working or then we have new you know merger of departments change is the constant so now yep. uh, you are putting people into such a high change and you know sort of high frequency change environment if you're not able to tell the story in which they can see their own future in it i i think it's 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 going to create so much uncertainty and then as a result of that such so much you know the the trust will diminish mm -hmm. and as as stephen covey said right things happen at the speed of trust in an organization um, the more the trust, the faster the things happen, you know, then you don't go into the whole thing. Let me check that. Let me make sure that, yeah. let me make sure this person signs off on that. Let me make sure I get an email to confirm that things happen at the speed of trust. 
Yeah, that's that's very true. That's very true. Uh, well, this has been fantastic, Anjali. Uh, great, great insights. Um, all of Anjali's information will be below this video. Um, but before we go, please do take a moment to tell people a little bit more about yourself. So I live in Singapore. So when we started the interview, yeah. it was dark, but now there's a I little bit see. of light. You can see yeah. uh, we are just 7.08. I live here. I've been living here for uh, since the year 2010. I've been uh, running a storytelling practice called Narrative of the Business of Stories since 2012. Uh, largely my work is within the digital transformation change storytelling. Um, it has just morphed into that. Uh, it's not a strategy that I went after. Mm -hmm. That's where the need was and that's where my expertise um, sort of kept developing. Um, I have, I have a, a huge uh, career uh, within the corporate world behind me. I've worked in India, uh, Singapore and Australia. Um, but now I run a storytelling practice, live here with my 13 year old daughter, um, husband Excellent. and two rescued dogs who are just oh, running wow. around. <laughs> <laughs> two very well behaved dogs by the sounds of things. I didn't hear them. Um, it's a bit early for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. They're like, what are you doing up this early? What's going on? That's right. <laughs> well, listen, thanks again, Anjali. And thank you for, and thanks everybody for tuning in. I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.